Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful, warm welcome and introduction. And I have a story to tell you today. Let's see if I can get my clicker to work here. Here we go. So uh, everybody tells us what a great accomplishment these things are. And before I can tell you anything about me, I have to remind you that everything I've done has been a team project. Um, it says right there on the chart, 20,000 people put that web telescope together. And it is on behalf of all humans that are here. And uh, there are about 10,000 professional astronomers in the world, and they can all use it. Uh, so can anybody, but you have to send us a proposal. Um, so anyway, uh, this particular project, the Webb Telescope, is a joint international project of NASA with the European and Canadian space agencies. And uh, we started it in 1995. At least my part of it started in 1995, and that wasn't even the beginning. Other people had already written a book that said, we need this telescope. And I had finished up working on the COBE satellite, and I got this phone call, would you like to join the new team? So I said yes. Nothing could be more interesting than that. So what you see in the picture is a gigantic golden hexagon, which is six and a half meters across. It is made out of 18 smaller hexagons, each of which about 1.3 meters across, and you would be able to pick it up if we let you. Um, they're made out of beryllium for its ultralight per, per, uh, structure and its stability when it's cold. Uh, and it's coated with gold because that's the best reflector for infrared light. It is protected in this picture by what you see is five gray layers. They're actually metallized kapton. Uh, and that's a big umbrella. It keeps the sun off. The sun is shining in the picture. The sun is shining up from the bottom of the picture. So of course, in real life, the telescope would be in the dark. You would not even be able to see it. So um, we'll tell you more about this um, design as we come along. Uh, but before I do all of that, I want to step back a bit. Uh, why are we doing all of this? Um, people want to know where do we come from? Um, and that's a pretty hard question. So we don't even know how to de define we. Not quite uh, like how far back do we count humans? 100,000 years, a million years, 10 million years? Well, at some point. Uh, the cosmic history, well, the astronomers can work on that part. We can tell you what do the atoms do. Uh, we can also work on are we alone uh, in the sense of where are the nearby planets that could be like Earth? Uh, we're not yet ready to tell you they are like Earth, and we certainly have not yet heard a signal from anybody out there that says, me, 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 I want to talk to you. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, a question that astronomers can work on, that NASA can work on a little bit, is, is life a miracle? as uh, ancient scientists used to think and most philosophers used to think? Or is it something that's a more popular idea today? Is it a thermodynamic, Im thermodynamic imperative? Something that will always happen, given a chance? That's my guess, but I can't prove that either. So how could you know? Well, you could find life somewhere else. Uh, and you would find out either that it's similar to ours or different. Uh, so pretty interesting things that NASA can work on. Uh, how far can we go? Well, not very far. We can get as far as Mars. We're not yet able to bring you back, so you better be friendly. And we can send you lots of food and lots of water, but we can't bring you back because we don't yet have the ability to make enough rocket fuel on the surface of Mars to get you back up. Not impossible when we started. Uh, we know what we have to do, but we haven't done it. So on the other hand, we astronomers, we take pictures and we use Imagine. So we can see with our imagination all the way back almost to the beginning of time, if there were such a thing. So there isn't really a beginning of time. There's only uh, um, moments beyond which you cannot imagine. And maybe that's what we call the beginning of time. But anyway, so what, that's uh, one of the reasons I've been interested in this general subject ever since I was a little guy. And uh, I think a lot of people here want to know the answers to these questions. So some people knew some of these answers a long time ago. This is a a uh, little fragment from a book called the, the On the Nature of Things from over 2,000 years ago. Uh, Lucretius was aware of the atomic theory. Uh, well, how would we have known in 2,000 years ago that things might be made out of atoms? Well, there wasn't a lot of uh, direct measurable evidence, but they, of course, could imagine that a glass of water would disappear when it evaporated by turning into invisible particles. So they kind of guessed 
and they were aware that things could be built up out of small particles, and then uh, you would even give them names, and then after a while they disintegrate, and we, anyway, so they were on to the, the linguistics of it as well. Not bad for 2,000 years ago, and we have one copy of this book which survived because uh, some of the monks failed to destroy the copies as they were supposed to do. There's a book about that called The Swerve, if you want to know the story of that book. Anyway, so a little bit about my history. Um, this is where I started off my life. Uh, this is Rutgers University Research Farm in far northern New Jersey, a mile off the Appalachian Trail. And I was there because my dad was studying dairy cows. And here's a little known fact. He got his master's degree studying dairy cows here at the University of Maryland. Uh, look, there's a little barn a few feet from here, right? Um, and that was important in 1940-something. So anyway, that's how I got started. The sky was blue. Uh, we went to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, and I was already wanting to be a scientist when I was about eight. So OK, it was an interesting place to start, because in the countryside, you can read books, but you can't, don't have a lot of other things you can do. So OK, starting with back in 1946, which is an important year for me, uh, 1946, Lyman Spitzer was a famous astronomer before the World War II, and he was still a famous astronomer afterwards. Uh, there he is climbing in the Alps. He wrote a book, uh, sorry, a report to the Rand Corporation saying we should build telescopes in space uh, for astronomy. And we already knew that we should build them to look down uh, for military reasons. And he even later on wrote a, a report that said, if you could polish out the surface of an asteroid to have a parabolic shape, uh, then you might be able to find planets around other stars. It's a pretty uh, visionary kind of guy. And uh, wrote textbooks that we still use today. So what else happened? And there was some, well, this is not a picture from 1946, but this is Sir Fred Hoyle, who named the Big Bang Theory. Uh, and we have him to blame for the fact that nobody understands it. Because with that name, people can't help picturing a firecracker, which is exactly the opposite of what astronomers have seen. We see infinite universe expanding into itself, and a firecracker is a small thing happening at a place in a pre-existing space and time. So it's the picture that you get from the name is exactly the wrong one, but I'm sorry, we can't get rid of it. It's still called the Big Bang Theory. It's good enough to have a TV show, um, which the New York Times, by the way, reported that when that show came on, it doubled enrollment in physics. Can you imagine that? OK, so who knows all the chaotic things that happened. Also, this person turned up. That was me in 1946. Well, that, that's not what I looked like in 1946. I was even smaller. At any rate, um, let's, I want to show you a little bit of history in 1948. Uh, the gentleman up there uh, on the left is Robert Herman, on the right is Ralph Alpher. Uh, they were working on the, uh, what was the universe like when it was young. Uh, we knew all about neutrons because we built an atomic bomb. Uh, everybody knew the properties of neutrons and we should be able to calculate uh, what the hydrogen and helium and other things might be doing in the early universe. And they got it about right. They said the universe should be filled with heat radiation that should still be left over from those early moments, should have a temperature of about 5 degrees Kelvin, which isn't bad, uh, considering that they had slide rules and uh, a pretty elementary theory at the time. Uh, anyway, nobody went to look for this cosmic background radiation, which would appear at uh, millimeter wavelengths. Um, if somebody had known there was a Nobel Prize waiting, they might have tried harder. Um, However, they didn't. So what happened in 1954, um, Mars was very close to Earth. Um, people went uh, to the Palomar telescope, the 200-inch diameter telescope, still use uh, English units, uh, and they thought they were going to see this. That's Mars, and it has canals on that picture. Well, they weren't there, and now we know they really weren't there because we went to visit. Uh, but where do you think the canals came from? They seem to have been the, the blood vessels in the back of the observer's eyes. And they, fool, they can fool you because uh, you go out and uh, the Mars has, the period of rotation of Mars is about the same as our day. So you see the same pattern every night when you go out. So 
So you'd think it was real when it wasn't. Sorry. So in 57, the Soviet Union put up a satellite called Sputnik, and uh, it was actually not a surprise. The New York Times told us at least 25 times it was going to happen. When it finally happened, this country was scared to, scared to death um, because it made very clear that the Soviet Union could attack us from space as well as with their long-range bombers. In 1957, school children like me were being told to hide under the desk in case of a nuclear attack. And you don't have to be very old to figure out that's not going to work. <laughs> so anyway, the country decided we are going to invest in science and technology and engineering, and we started things up in many places, and suddenly science fairs were available for a little guy like me, and summer schools and all kinds of things. So in 58, um, NASA was formed. NASA, and we're not going to let the Soviet Union get ahead of us, and they were ahead of us because they'd already launched the Sputnik. They were ahead of us in many areas. Anyway, we started up NASA in 1958, and then Jack Kennedy announced uh, in, uh, a few years later in 62. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the other. So we said it, and we did it. He said a lot of things in there. And in there is one of the answers to many questions that I get. Um, isn't space program a big waste of time? He said, we're going to do this to learn how to do big things. So we've learned project management. We learned quality control. We learned risk management. Uh, we actually had a disaster under James Webb's watch. Uh, anyway, uh, so we learned how to do it. And so we are now able to do it. And who's the guy that made that happen? There's James Webb. James Webb was the second administrator of NASA, and he's the guy who went to Jack Kennedy with a plan for the Apollo program. Um, there are a lot of things he did to make that happen. Um, one of the ones that was he, he was smart enough not to believe scientists and engineers knew what they were talking about when it came to budget. Uh, he was in the taxi cab on the way to visit the president and did not have Excel spreadsheets. He had an opinion and it himself. So he decided, I'm not asking for enough money. He doubled the budget request on his way to see the president. And then it was about enough. If he had not done that, it would have been a national disaster. So he had the common sense to recognize that was a huge risk. He also, by the way, started space astronomy and, and visits to the planets under his watch. Um, I'm, with the disaster, by the way, was the Apollo 1 had a fire sitting on the ground. and. Uh, and then he, he made sure that we found out what the problem was and fixed it, and then they resigned. So it would not be an election issue in the next election. So we got to launch to the moon in 1969, a year when I was putting little boys to bed at summer camp uh, at the time of the moon landing. So stories, now coming back to astronomy. So how do we know what we're talking about in astronomy? Well, first we have to survey the universe. Uh, we do it with triangles which um, at least the top method would have been well known 2,000 years ago, and the ancient Greeks knew the size of the Earth and the distance to the moon. But right, um, they would have understood the other method of uh, relative brightness. If I promise you those two candles I drew are the same, uh, but one is fainter, we say it's because it's further away. So now we can survey the distance to things in the, everywhere. Uh, we can also measure the motions of things toward us and are in a way. This is called the Doppler shift, pretty well known, uh, known and understood. But nature gives us particular special wavelengths that are emitted and absorbed by particular atoms and molecules. So if you spread out the sunlight into a rainbow, you'll see dark bars across it that are called spectrum lines coming from those different atoms and molecules. And so now if you do the same for another star, 
you say the same pattern, you say, well, that star is a lot like the sun. Um, and so quite often, however, you say, and all the wavelengths are multiplied by some number. And the interpretation of that is, well, this other object is moving away from us or toward us at some speed. And uh, now we can measure the speed of motion toward us and away from us. Now we can survey the whole universe, distance and motion. So back in 1929, uh, Edwin Hubble drew us this graph. It was the first one that we had in a graphic form that showed this information. So what he's got here on the horizontal axis um, is apparent distance. On the vertical axis, uh, speed of motion away from us. So some big surprises on this plot. Uh, one is there's a trend. The farther away, the faster. Seems to be a decent fit to a straight line. If you divide the distance by the speed, you get the apparent age of the universe. 1929, we discovered the expanding universe was a sort of real thing. I can remember your history because that's also the year the worldwide economy collapsed. Uh, collapsed in expansion at the same time. So, uh, by the way, the, this uh, had been predicted by astronomer, mathematician, Georges Lemaitre. He was a Belgian Catholic priest, a parish priest, as well as having his doctorate from MIT. So he had applied Einstein's equations and he said, this should be so. Einstein laughed at him and he said, You're, Mathematics is correct, your physics is abominable. So Einstein was wrong, at least once. Um, so this is the first time we knew the universe had an age, um, and uh, people didn't actually have much they could do yet um, with this information, um, but measure better. So, however, what happened next? Well, I'm skipping over a lot. Uh, I went to graduate school in Berkeley. Uh, my thesis project ended up to be an attempt to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation that had been predicted back in 1948, had been discovered in 1965, uh, and it seemed like a decent graduate student project to do. Okay, we've well, got to measure more. So my thesis advisor designed this apparatus, which went up on a high altitude balloon. We built it, we flew it, and it did not work. I got to write a thesis about a thing that did not work. And uh, people nevertheless said, OK, it's good enough. We'll let you out. And I, got, <laughs> and I got a job at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. And there it is, um, upstairs from Tom's Restaurant. Um, some of you TV fans would know that that's from Seinfeld. There really is a Tom's Restaurant, and I ate there. Um, at any rate, I was there for a few months, and NASA said, we want proposals for new satellite missions. Uh, we had just landed on the moon five years before that. And um, OK, now what are we going to do? Uh, you can't keep on going back to the moon, and so ask for science. So my thesis project failed. Let's try it in outer space. A little bit of nerve there. But my boss knew how important it was. He knew who to call. We called up our friends, and we wrote a proposal, quite thin. It said, we've got an idea. And I thought, well, that'll never do anything. Um, but NASA got about 150 proposals. And eventually they said, OK, well, this is interesting enough. Um, we'll support further technical study. So I moved here to Goddard in Greenbelt. And um, we got going with real engineers who knew how to make something work. So that was the beginning of the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite. And there it is uh, in our drawing. It was launched on November 18th of 1989, 15 years after the first napkin sketch, uh, and it worked. So it worked beautifully. So I'll show you a little bit about what we did, but uh, number one, we measured the spectrum of this cosmic heat, we confirmed that it matches very exactly the prediction of the expanding universe story. Notice I'm not calling it the Big Bang, it's the expanding universe. Um, and it, the pic and the way we did that was we had a black piece of plastic, put it in the top of the antenna, and when it matched the, the observation that we got from the sky, we said it's a, it matches the spectrum of a, what we call a black body. So there's a formula for that, but we basically said direct substitution test. Here's our universe simulator. Here's the universe. They match. We also made a map, and this is the map of the, of the brightness of this heat radiation across the whole sky. 
So uh, observations were done at millimeter wavelengths, which was quite a difficult technology in 1989. We're much better at it now. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the hot and cold spots here are about a part in 100,000 different from the average. And the way that's accomplished was uh, with a differential microwave radiometers. Two antennas pointed 60 degrees apart um, make hundreds of millions of measurements of the differences between those two antennas and then make a computer calculation, at least squares fit, to make this map. So we now see that the early universe was not uniform. It's very slight density variations. And uh, Stephen Hawking saw this. He said, that's the most important scientific discovery of the century if not of all time. OK, first thought was, thanks very nice, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so but why was it so important to him and to us as scientists? Well, number one, um, we would not exist if there was no spot in the early universe. If it had been perfectly smooth, the expansion would have continued to be smooth forever. It would not have been unstable enough to grow into galaxies and stars and planets and people. So we're here because of those spots. Number two, most of them come from cosmic dark matter, which we deduce but cannot see because it's transparent. Uh, number three, the pattern is affected by cosmic dark energy, which is a kind of cosmic acceleration, which again, we cannot see but we can deduce. And number four, if we ever do but understand what made the spots, it might become a test of quantum gravity. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but we, that's one of the great mysteries of science is dark matter, dark energy, and quantum gravity, we don't know any of them. So we, we think we should have them, but we don't have them. So that's the beginning of my career. Uh, and I got to go off to Stockholm in 2006 and get my diploma from the king. And there's my spectrum showing the, the expanding universe story is about right. So OK. By the way, what do you do with a check from Stockholm? Spend it on students, mostly ballet students, because my late wife was a ballet teacher, and summer students at NASA Goddard and uh, the Hertz Foundation, which gave me a scholarship once. So um, students. More students, please. So what happens now? Well, OK. Um, well, the Cosmic Background Explorer worked fine. Uh, a few months after, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. And it was going to check out all these predictions that we had about the early universe. And as you probably remember, it was not in focus. It took us about three years to get it fixed, thanks to Senator Barbara Mikulski, who said that we will fix it. And so we did. And when it was fixed, then uh, we got really sharp pictures. And suddenly, this was when the internet was young, the internet crashed. You could not get all the data from the new pictures through the internet. Anyway, so. Pretty soon, however, astronomers said, that's a great telescope. Uh, it's working beautifully now. And by the way, it's not answering one of our big questions, which was, how did the first galaxies form? And why did they not be able to see that? Because the telescope was not able to see far enough back in time to see those first objects. So they wrote a book. Please build us another telescope that's more powerful and pick up the infrared that it would take to see those first galaxies growing. And by the way, there are lots of other things we would do too, but that's the most difficult ex uh, experiment we want to try. So we did. There it is. There's the James Webb Space Telescope, named after James Webb, the administrator who went to Jack Kennedy with a plan for Apollo. Uh, and it is now, uh, I'll show you again, an international partnership. Um, I'm showing you where the pieces come from. Um, Northrop Grumman is our big aerospace contractor. They're located near LA Airport. Um, we have instruments that come from the United States, Canada, and Europe. Operations are from our, in Baltimore, as they are for the Hubble Space Telescope. And the telescope is cold. The big golden hexagon runs at a temperature of about 40 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, three of the four instruments do as well, and one of them runs at 7 Kelvin. That requires a little refrigerator. So it's a, an astonishing accomplishment to build this. And by the way, it is much bigger than a rocket. So it is folded up for launch. And I, a lot of you may have seen the scary movie of how, it, how that goes. Um, I'm not sure I have it in the picture show for today, but let's see. Anyway, it was launched on a European rocket called the Ariane 5 from French Guiana. And there it is going up into space. 
uh, we'd have perfect launch. And uh, we were very lucky because you don't always get perfect launch, but perfect launch means didn't have to spend any extra fuel adjusting the orbit. And uh, that means extra long life for the observatory. This is where we put it. We put it around the Lagrange point L2 um, of the sun and the earth. Uh, the Lagrange points, all five of them, are places where if you put the object, um, the combined force of the gravity of the sun and the earth will allow it to stay there, moving around the sun once a year. So first three were discovered by Leonid Euler in 1750. So our particular one, L2, is 1.5 million kilometers farther from the sun than we are, which is 1% of the distance to the sun. So this picture is definitely not to scale. But anyway, it's a good place to put a telescope because the telescope does not get any farther away, stays home. Uh, it can, it's over, always overhead at midnight. Sounds like a good thing for an astronomer's habits. Um, and basically, we can talk to it any time. So here is our scary movie. This is what we imagine happened in outer space. Uh, of course, we, can, we didn't actually take movies of it in outer space, but we uh, made this happen. First, you see the unfolding of the solar panels and the transmitter receiving dish. Here, we're unfolding the structure that holds up the sunshade. Then we'll stretch it out. And uh, by the way, if you look at this, you say, that's awfully, awfully, awfully complicated. How are you ever going to make it work? And the answer would be um, test and test and test. We actually tested it four times, unfolding it. And uh, only after the fourth test were we satisfied. And at that point, we said, well, if we test it in one more time, not only will it take time and money, we could wreck it. So quit while we're at the right spot. So here we're finally pulling on cords that separate the five layers of the sunshade. And uh, the telescope is not quite ready because it's still warm and it will be cold and it's not in focus, even though at this point it's now been unfolded. So it took uh, a couple of months for us to let it cool off to the right temperature before we could even get it in focus. So there it is, and it seems to be doing just exactly what we hoped it would do in outer space. Thanks to an incredible amount of time, energy, and brilliant people that made a plan and they made it work. By the way, people asked us if we were worried about the project at launch. And the answer was, uh, for me and for my project manager, no, not worried. We did what we're supposed to do. And uh, a lot of you heard that we did have a hazard in outer space. Uh, we have a hazard of something called micrometeoroids. Little sand grains, about a thousandth of an inch in size, come flying through space at 30 kilometers a second. And if, you would hit, if one would hit you, you would feel it. It would really hurt. But if you just had the sand grain in your fingers, you'd never know it was there. So we get them about once a month on this big mirror. And after about six months, we had one that made a dimple. You see in the lower right corner, there's a white spot on this map of the surface if error. And if it were a uniform gray, you'd be happy. And there's a bump, and it's white, so that's bad. So for a while, we were pretty worried, but we haven't had another one, and it's almost two years now. So um, I think we're OK. But even if we had another one, it would be OK, because we can always refocus the telescope a little bit to compensate. So we're happy with the telescope. It's working beautifully. So now I want to show you uh, why did we design it this way. So number one, what's special about infrared light? Why do you want to use that? So here's one reason. Um, yeah, this is a picture of a star being born inside a dust cloud. And you can barely see the star, but it's there in the middle, in the front. And it has two arms sticking out to the right and left. And you can't really see the rest because of the dust. So why is there dust in space? Well, there's dust in space because when stars get old, um, they either explode or shed their surface uh, very gradually in many ways. And so the material comes back out. So all of the uh, chemical elements that were produced by nucleosynthesis in the core of the star, uh, hydrogen burning into helium and so forth, gets spit back out into space. So that dust um, used to be on the inside of a star. So did the building that we're in. Hydrogen and helium were here in the beginning, but the rest of us were not. 
So all of our atoms, almost all of them, were inside the star at one time. So, but if you look at the infrared version of that picture, uh, you can begin to see through the cloud of dust. So why is that? Because uh, light's a wave. Light uh, can bend around an object that's smaller than the size of the wave, and it'll bounce off an object that's bigger than the wave length. So, okay, so use infrared to see inside dusty clouds. Uh, another thing is, some things are not warm enough to, to send out light you can see with your eyes. Uh, they're only warm enough to emit infrared. So here is a, an object called the Southern Ring Nebula. It looks like a Southern Ring Planetary Nebula. It only looks like a planet. It's one of those stars that's actually shedding its surface. And so uh, the, it's too cool to send out all of its light in the, in the visible wavelengths. So here's a magnified picture of it. Um, you can even see, actually, in the center, uh, one of the stars is, has a companion. Uh, there are really at least two in there. Calculation says there are five. And that's the reason for this weird non-circular shape. Anyway, so to see cool objects, not warm enough to send their own visible light. Number three, um, oh, I forgot I had this picture. This is a, one of those movies that we make after we've seen a weird picture. The picture on the left is a set of dust rings around a star. And it's, uh, they're not even circular, so how did this happen? The story we tell is that two objects are going around each other, and when they get close together, uh, one of them spits out a puff of gas and dust. And that's the reason for that funny looking picture on the left. So astronomers look twice, once with a picture and once with imagination. So the third reason to look at infrared light is because space is expanding. Another way of saying that is distant objects are running away from us very rapidly. So we receive wavelengths that are much longer than they were when they were emitted. So we need an infrared telescope to picture up, pick up the light that was visible or ultraviolet even. So that's why we built the web telescope the way we did. So here I'll start to show you some, now some of the pictures we got. This is a first one we released to July 11th last year. Uh, it shows a number of things you can clearly see. Uh, there's some pretty stars in there with a eight with a six, six legs sticking out. Those are actually just due to diffraction of light on the edges of the hexagons. Uh, so they just tell us there's a nice bright star in the center. Um, then there, are, in the middle, you see a big white fuzzy object, which turns to be a very massive galaxy. And there are quite a, a lot of other ones in there. Um, so a lot of gravity coming from those. Then around that, you see a lot of funny looking pink arcs, uh, which are, as it turns out, highly magnified images of very, very distant galaxies. Einstein told us that gravity works by bending space time. And in particular, gravity can focus and distort the image of another star object behind. So those pink arcs are actually highly magnified images of very distant galaxies. So we knew those that were there. We knew where this cluster of galaxies would be that would do this. And so it was one of our very first targets. We're very happy with it because it shows things that are details you would never be able to see with just a telescope. So one of our first big surprises from this observatory is that the first galaxies seem to be too, off, too frequent, uh, they're too big, too bright, too hot, and happen too soon. So, so how do you know? Well, what we do is we hunt for them by things that have funny colors. Uh, first we take a picture with a camera, the infrared camera, and we say, uh, find anything that only has infrared light and no visible or shorter wavelengths. Uh, that's a clue that it's uh, coming from a very distant universe. Then go back and take a picture with a spectrometer and spread out the light into the rainbow and see if your story is right. So we did that and you see this collection of little fuzzy dots that all have spectra to confirm their nature. And the answer seems to be, yeah, no, we were, we were very surprised. Uh, when people built the Hubble, they said they knew how it would happen, and they were wrong. When we built the Webb telescope, they said they knew how it would happen, and we were wrong. Um, now, in the last two weeks, a few people say they know why we were wrong. Well, we'll now argue about this for a few years, um, because it's not simple. Yeah, this is the kind of evidence you have, and you have to make up a very detailed story worth many journal publications. And finally, we'll say maybe we understand. 
we are now even able to observe a material orbiting around a black hole. So people say, well, how can you see a black hole? Well, you don't. You see material that's falling in, and when it's falling in, it gets compressed and heated to high temperatures. And here we've even able to make a map of the velocities of different kinds of material orbiting around that black hole. So we've got uh, different kinds of atoms and molecules and uh, calculating orbital velocities. And ca anyway, this is our beginning to understand how do, how do the black holes grow. I told you we had highly magnified images. Here is uh, one of those funny look looking pink arcs and then stretched out so you can see better. This particular very early galaxy has a thing we call sparklers. There are lots of little hot, uh, small globular clusters in there. So we're trying to answer now the question, which came first? Did the galaxy grow from all at once from a big cloud, or did it grow from assembling uh, lots of these smaller objects? Um, so this is a question to be answered. Uh, let's see, what have I got here? Oh, I'm showing you here that once in a while, uh, that gravitational lens that Einstein gave us has almost infinite magnification. So there's a story here about a single individual star which has been magnified by like 10,000 times. So we can now pick it up at an immense distance. So who knew that gravity would work like that? So we can even get a sort of spectrum as though it were nearby. So other pretty pictures to show you. This is a thing called the Stefan's Quintet. It's five galaxies that appear to be next to each other. Uh, they're not quite. The one on the left is closer than the others. Um, the four on the right are in the process of squeezing together. They are merging together. You see the one in the middle there has two eyes, and they will be merged together in a few hundred million years. Uh, by the way, uh, that's going to happen to us too. The Andromeda Nebula is coming in our direction. It'll be here in about two billion years. And so our galaxy will merge with that galaxy and it'll no longer be a beautiful spiral. Uh, we probably won't be here. Um, anyway, the top galaxy has a black hole in it. We'll work on how does that work also. Yeah, come on. Uh, okay, this is a picture. Uh, this is a, we call it the Cartwheel Galaxy because it looks like that. The little red galaxy went right through the middle of the big one, and what we're seeing here is a splash. So we now say, well, interpret that, astronomers, and all those, the glowing ring is a brand new burst of new stars that were all born at the same time. So now we can begin to learn how our stars formed when something dramatic happens, a collision. This is a slice through a sponge. That's how it looks, isn't it? Um, this is a picture of a galaxy that we used to think was just an ordinary spiral, but now you see it's got holes in it. And why are there holes in a galaxy? Because brand new stars were born in the middle of those, of those holes. They produced so much energy that pushed away all the neighborhood material. So the holes in galaxies come from brand new stars. This is our version of something we call the pillars of creation. Um, they took pictures of this with the Hubble Space Telescope, and now we have the infrared version, too. Um, the infrared version allows us to see inside the pillars. See the stars are being born. A few special spots, and you see on the middle pillar on the right-hand side, there's a little glowing red dot. So that's something that's just been formed in there. You can see there's a very dramatic wind that's been blowing from the top right to the lower left. See how it's blowing around the things that are there. You can see the the way the gas cloud is trailing off. Uh, you can see little knots of high density. Stars are being born inside there. When we get done writing our papers about this, we'll say, now we understand how stars are formed. Here's one that's actually being formed as we speak, and this is a close-up of it. Um, what well, looks like a hamburger bun there is actually um, the, the hamburger in this picture, the dark thing in the middle is a, a new solar system seen edge on. So our solar system is all in orbiting in one single plane, and there's some dust grains with us. There's so, so much dust in that one that it's opaque. So there's this, the star is right there in the middle of the hamburger, but you can't see it. But you can see that it's shining up and down and illuminating the neighborhood. If you were to come back in 100,000 years, uh, the dust would mostly be gone. The star will be ordinary by then. 
and maybe we'll be able to see the planets because we think there are probably a handful of planets orbiting in that little hamburger bun. So once in a while we get a big surprise. This one just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, ordinarily we think a planet like Jupiter will be formed around a star like the Sun. What they found in the Orion Nebula is uh, sometimes they just come in pairs. Jupiter-sized objects uh, orbiting each other. So a big surprise. No one expected this. Uh, so we have to think again about how they're formed. Do you see them? They've identified, uh, first you find a little speck and then you magnify it so you can see what's going on. So of course we want to know, are we alone? We started off with that question. Here is what we can do about that. Um, we have the ability to do transit spectroscopy. So when a star, when, when you watch a star long enough, sometimes a planet will go in front of the star and block some starlight. Um, if you wait long enough, it'll do it over and over. And you say, now I know how long it takes to go around the star. You can calculate the size and the temperature. And uh, is it maybe, maybe, would it be like Earth? Well, maybe. Um, and sometimes, uh, if some of the starlight goes through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope, we can tell. So that's our plan. Uh, so we've looked at Earth-sized planets, and we looked at bigger planets. And the upshot so far is, well, none of the Earth-sized planets have an atmosphere, and all of the big ones do, with various kinds of molecules. So we're not ready to tell you there are or are not any places that could be like Earth because this did not really answer the question. But we got some more pretty pictures. Here's the solar system. Here's Jupiter with its great red spot. It's no longer red because we don't have a red camera. We have infrared. Uh, Jupiter has an aurora that you can see in the picture. It has a ring around it as well as lots of satellites. We did uh, send a probe to, a, to try to deflect an, an asteroid. Uh, this was a, there's an asteroid pair out there, so we have a good way, way to tell. Anyway, uh, everybody who had a telescope that could watch it, watched it. And so the Webb telescope watched the debris flying out from the collision. We dropped a big cylinder of metal into the asteroid to see what would happen. So it moved, and it moved about five times as much as we would have had if it were just a billiard ball collision. So we're learning about how to protect the Earth from killer asteroids. There are other things to worry about, but we can work on that one. So we're working on that one. By the way, Congress said, please do. Please protect us. Please find them all, and please get ready just in case any of them are coming at us. Um, so we're getting there. Uh, what else did we do? We got a picture of Titan. Titan's an ad a satellite of Saturn. And we are going back to Titan, and we landed there a long, long time ago. This time we're going with a helicopter. That's a huge engineering accomplishment to be able to fly a helicopter on a Titan because the temperature out there is about 50 or 60 Kelvin. So I'm not going to tell you how they did it or are doing it, but we do expect it to work. Uh, we have a picture of Neptune. Neptune also has a ring of dust orbiting around it with the Greek names for its satellites. Here's Uranus. It has satellites and rings. These satellites are named after Shakespearean characters. By the way, this one's interesting because of all the planets in the solar system, this is the only one where the spin axis is not more or less perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. So we get to look at the pole of this particular planet for a while. So anyway, pretty pictures for now. Eventually, the scientist will say, I understand how it works and many articles will be published and we'll be able to make you movies about what's going on under the clouds, um, what's, this, what's the core of the planet like, all those things that you'd like to know about the rest of our solar system. So I think I'll conclude here with an invitation to come check us out on our many websites, although you can hardly avoid seeing our news in the newspaper these days because it's all the time there. So thanks for the invitation to come, and I think we might have time for some questions.